The topic of today's discussion is the balanced use of chemistry. And are we rolling? We're rolling. Okay. Unfortunately today, there are a lot of cleaners that only have strong chemicals on their truck. They gotta be pH 13, they have to be very strong, very concentrate. Uh, they only want the strongest chemicals. It's like, it's like going hunting for deer and you're only bringing a shotgun <laughs> or you're bringing a nuclear missile to go hunt for, for pheasant. Okay, you don't always need the strongest chemical in order to clean a carpet, to clean a tile floor, to clean a, a stone floor, to clean a countertop. If you keep using a very strong chemical all the time in somebody's house when it really doesn't need it, you're actually contributing to indoor environmental pollution. Because what happens is that you're using a strong chemical in the house, the glycol ethers, the butyls are off-gassing, and you could be causing a health problem that you may not be aware of. So it's always better to use balanced chemistry. And the topic of today's discussion is try to avoid a redo, right? Redos are very expensive for carpet cleaners. Uh, wicking, things that come back. And many times wicking is because the carpet was not completely rinsed of chemical. And the chemical acts like a, ma a magnet. And as the carpet is drying, soil is pulled out of the subfloor and out of the padding and it, the carpet becomes blotchy. And that's from improper rinsing. So uh, in this audience today, are we truck mount? I know you're a truck mount user. You have a truck mount, sir? You got a truck mount? So in your, in your chemical jug, what are you using as, what's coming out of your wand as you're cleaning? What's the pH of the chemical coming out of your wand? Oh, you just started? Okay, so it's called a chemical jug. It's last step chemical injection. What's, what's your pH, sir? What do you use coming out of your wand? What was that? You never mentioned it? Yeah, the one that comes out? You don't use it? It's using regular water then. Yeah, the rinse, yeah, the rinse. 3.5 acid, okay, good. And, and Todd, you're using what? Using the acid, good. See, what happens is that a lot of guys are putting detergent in the rinse, and you, it's okay to do that as long as you shock the carpet when you're done. So, say you have a pH 9.5 detergent, but then what they do is they get a heavy detergent, like a pH 10 to 11 rinse, and it's coming out of your truck mount like boiling lava at 220 degrees of boiling hot soap. And it does a very good job cleaning. But if you're cleaning over 500 PSI, that boiling hot detergent lava, it's going into the pad. And then the carpet looks clean when they're done, right? They get paid and then they go. And as the carpet is drying, it comes up and that's when the next day it dries. Now for many years, uh, I work for a franchise, I work for Coit right now, I work for Coit, uh, I work for ChemDry as well. And ChemDry had the policy that you could not leave until the carpet was dry. Good policy. I use the same policy for myself, even though Coit doesn't force me to do it. Because if, when I leave the house, if the carpet's dry, if they call me up to say the carpet has a spot on it, it's, you got it, you got it. Miss Cermak, yes, you look different online. With your, with your, why is the people that are online, they, they, they have their, their, their poster ready. This is, this is a, this is a. I'm pictures, I just stand there. He just tries to look good. We all try to look better on Facebook and our LinkedIn profiles. So you have to understand, now I'm a Bible guy. And the Bible in the book of Psalms says, all men are liar proof to be, let God be found true. So Bi Bible's basic saying everybody lies, right? So you have that little old lady, sweet little old lady, she gave you a $10 tip. She says, oh, this spot came back. 
but you knew left the carpet was dry unless she killed the cat the cat came back okay don't be suckered to drive 50 miles out to do a free spot if you can okay unless she has other jobs for you that's what I'm trying to say is the use of balanced chemistry you got to trust the process and I'm going to tell you a secret it might get me in trouble it's going to get me in trouble you know I'm a troublemaker right Say you have a, a bottle of chemical that says pH 9.5. That 9.5 is at the manufacturer's recommended dilution ratio. So if it says two ounces to a gallon of water, the product will be 9.5. What happens if you put one ounce of the chemical into the gallon of water? Is it still 9.5? That is correct. You can, if you have a, a pH 11 product on your truck, and you have a, a fabric that you don't want to go pH 11, but you're like, oh wait a minute, you know, I, uh, I don't have a pH 8 on my truck. I don't have a neutral cleaner on my truck. You can take your pH 10, your pH 11, and cut the dilution ratio in half. And now you have a weaker chemical. Correct. Correct. It still has to be tested, but you can lower the pH of a chemical by diluting it. But you cannot increase the pH of a chemical. So if you, if it says two ounces will give you pH 9.5, putting in 10 ounces won't make it any stronger. And that's what leads to wicking and callbacks and over concentration of chemicals. You can make the chemical weaker if you're afraid of a bad effect on the fabric. But don't think you can make it stronger by increasing the concentration. What you're doing is you're making it harder to rinse. And if you're using a truck mount, if that concentrated chemical gets into the, the padding, Okay, that padding can cause wicking and then a callback. It also can cause odors. Because you know what, what, what soap does not fix? Mold and mildew. You know you can grow mold on soap? You know how I know there's mold and mildew? Does, the soap doesn't clean it? Because of my shower at home. I have to take bleach to my shower. I get that stuff, uh, stuff I, the foaming stuff, and I got to do it because there's soap scum on the shower, right? And mold grows on the soap scum. So you soak the carpet with a strong detergent. Let's say there's some mold spores in the carpet. The mold will grow on the soap. And then somebody calls you back, I smell a funny odor in the house. And you come back and you spray a topical deodorizer on, on it and you spray it, it's on the fibers. But guess what? The, the mold is growing in the carpet, in, 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 the, in the pad. Well, usually it's growing in the latex, which is the primary and secondary. Correct. I have Tom, Thomas Cermak, everybody. Here he is, Thomas Cermak in the audience. Sorry. He, no, no, he's an expert. I appreciate it. So yes, it's growing in the pad, but technically it's growing in the latex. The latex, because latex is also a food source for the mold. You need a food source, you need moisture, and you need temperature. So how can you avoid getting a moldy carpet? You start off by only keeping balanced chemistry in your truck. If you have something that's pH 13, a firebomb product, save it for special occasion. Don't use the nuclear missile, the shotgun, as the first choice to clean the carpet. I promise you, 95% of the carpets that you clean, unless you clean apartments only. If your whole thing is apartments and move outs, it's different. But if you do basic residential cleaning or, or commercial cleaning, 95% of the time, a pH 9.5 product is all you need. And then if you want to juice it up with a little bit of natural delaminine, maybe a little bit of oxidizer, 
And if for some reason you're working and it's not coming as clean as you want, don't make that mixture any stronger. What can you make stronger we just talked about? What's coming out of your wand? Your uh, water. You can turn the temperature up. You can increase the agitation on your freezer. Sure. You can do a lot of things to make it more chemically effective. Any more chemical usually has a diminishing effect. Correct. But if you have an acid rinse coming out of your wand, right, and you make one swipe, and the carpet didn't come totally clean, then you make five more swipes, okay, what's happening is that it's just you getting exercise. You are getting exercise for free. You're getting your cardio in, okay? Because here's the secret. Acid rinses, unless they are specially made with surfactants, do not clean anything. There are some acids on the market that do have cleaning surfactancy, but they're not very strong. So that's why they have detergent rinses in the event that you're cleaning a home and your 9.5 with some oxygen delaminin is, oh, you know what, it can get a little bit better. It's not coming as clean as I want. You don't want to overwet the carpet with the acid. So what you do is you swap out your jug and you get like, like a, on the market, this form of the 90 from DSC, there's a R6. They're light lemony detergents that are like a pH 9 to 10. And in my truck that I use, working for Coit, is I have two different, two different buckets. And acid rinse is one. And if it's not working, I go to the detergent. You see, and then you have a pH 9 or 10 coming out of your wand at 220 degrees. So you don't have to make your pre-spray more gooey. You don't have to make your pre-spray harder to rinse. But now you've used a pH 10 rinse on the carpet. Now for older people like myself and Mr. Cermak, who's like 40, 42 years old, um, back, back in the 70s and 80s when hot water extraction was in infancy, they had a term called shocking the carpet or souring the carpet. Um, it would almost be like a vinegar-like solution. It almost smelled like, like vinegar. It probably was vinegar. Acetic acid. Acetic acid. It's still all vinegary and you'd mist it on the carpet to neutralize the shampoo because they had shampoo machines back in the day. They shampoo the carpet, literally. So you'd shock the carpet with a vinegary smelling acetic acid. So today we don't have to have the vinegar odor. So you have acid rinses like all fiber rinse and other rinses that are like a 3.5, like you have 3.5 acetic acid. So after you've extracted at a pH 10 or nine, the carpet is still glowing with a 10 while it's wet. You don't need to use a lot of it. It's a light mist. It's a chemical reaction. You don't need to re-extract the carpet with the acid. You walk through and you have a pump sprayer. You put a light mist on the carpet. You shock the carpet with the acetic acid and then you're done. Then you rake it. it leaves the carpet soft. If you don't have a pH meter and you're worried if the carpet is high pH, if the carpet feels gummy or crunchy, when you finish cleaning, that means you left it behind detergent. That is going to be a callback. For some reason, this information I'm giving you does not get through to people's heads. I mean, there's franchises like Chemdry and Zero Res that have made a very good living coming behind the mistakes of standard carpet cleaners. Because there's so many standard carpet cleaners that can't get their chemistry balanced. A lot of that's lack of education. They go, to, they, go, they go online and they go, oh, this is the strongest thing, I need to use that. But just because it's strong doesn't mean that you need it. So um, I have some free gifts here today. I have uh, some of the stuff I have in Cap Hero from uh, DSC. We have more samples back. This is a pH 10 sodium percarbonate powder with the laminine in it, but it's also a low moisture encapsulation agent. So use it with a brush machine to encapsulate carpet, but also it's a pre-spray. It's pH 10 because of the peroxide, but when it dries, the pH comes down. Sodium percarbonate keeps it high. It would be a pH 9 otherwise. And I have a sample called Neutral Hero, Neutral Hero, which is new from DSC. This is kind of a unique product. You can use it on, on fabric or hard surfaces.
the way they've formulated the surfactancy. And I've used it, it's really good. And so I've other, some other GIFs up here. Another thing that you want to do is, with spotting is a lot of people use spotter the wrong way. They put spotter on the carpet like they're putting ketchup on their hot dog. So the spotter goes past the, the fiber that has the problem, right? And where does the spotter wind up? In the padding and the backing. And you, you use a strong solvent or some sort of caustic chemical, like a, like a, um, like a reducing agent. <laughs> and it eats the latex, the backing of the carpet. Get these strong chemicals, right? So you gotta be careful with your spotters. Some spotters you have to extract, read the directions. You have non-volatile solvents that you absolutely have to extract, or you have to evaporate using what? Volatile solvent. See, you, you've come up first. I'll give you a free gift. Here you are. Free gift to the demand man. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. I got all kinds of DSC. I, I use that all the time. I know you do. Here, you take it. Because you're, you, you're from the, you're a Midwesterner. Yeah, I'm from Ohio. I, I've been using DSC since uh, like 92. Yeah, yeah. It's like, DSC is the, the biggest brand nobody's ever heard of. So you have here a situation where people are spotting the wrong way. So. SCAT, which is from DSC, is renewably formulated. It eats everything that's organic, like Pac-Man, it just keeps eating. But it is optional to rinse it. So if you are an encapsulating cleaner, and you don't have an extractor, and you have a PP pee, pee stain on the carpet, you can use this to, to pre-spot, blot the PP pee pee stain, and then you can leave it, just encapsulate. If you want to soak the carpet with it and you want to extract with a, with a water claw or something else, you can as well. So if this has been formulated to only eat organic matter, it will not eat the latex backing in the carpet and cause carpet bubbles. It's important to remember that if you overuse any spotter, it's a bad thing. But it's important to use spotters that will do the least amount of damage to the carpet. Because if you have a permanent stain on the fiber, what do you have to do to get rid of the permanent stain? Has anybody ever tried to remove a tattoo here? Okay? It's painful, you can Google it. What happens is that, is that the fiber has dye sites on it, and when the stain gets on the fiber, it's permanently stained. The peroxide and bleaching products that we use make the stain invisible, but it's still there. Have you ever seen that, that Billy guy? I think he's dead now. I feel bad for him. He's with the beard. He had the OxyClean commercial. Yep. Watch it Saturday morning, and the, shirt, the shirt's clean. Put a black light on the shirt. The shirt's not clean. What oxygen does is oxygen changes the molecule and makes it invisible to the spectrum in our human eye. We cannot see it anymore. Exactly. And now for, if oxygen doesn't work, they have reducing agents, like reducing bleach. Reducing bleach is used mostly in the laundry industry by people that look like Darth Vader. They have a hood on, and they wear a respirator, and they have a vacuum hood, and you put like a fine blouse, you bring it to the, and they use a reducing bleach with a Q-tip to get the stains out of your clothing. We have carpet cleaners making buckets, buckets of reducing bleach. And they're pouring it on the carpet and they're raking it in, okay? There's people that do that. They mix up a big thing of it and because you mix it up, it goes bad because you can't, you can't store it after you mix it, right? So you mix up this giant like gallon jug of it. And you say, well, I gotta use the rest of it anyway. And you put it everywhere. A little bit's good, a lot's better, right? Yes, and you wind up causing a health hazard in the house. And if people have a baby, reducing bleach is a poison. And that chemical is not necessarily meant to be extracted. You use a little bit of it, you put a fan on it, and it neutralizes it when it dries, but it's not necessarily used to be, if you read the directions, it says spray and go, like CSR, coffee stain remover, spray and go. But this is spray and go, but it's not going to kill anybody. CSR 
you spray it. If it's still damp and you walk away, and, and a little baby crawls over that spot, and touch, they will die. So it's spray and go, but I would not leave. I would not go until the spot is dry. But that's balanced chemistry, knowing what you're using. What's poisonous, what's not. All these chemicals are, are poisonous, but some are more poisonous than others. And some will cause wicking, some will cause uh, odd stains. Has anybody here ever turned a carpet orange? I have too. We're all, we're all beginners, right? Why, why does the color of the carpet change for a gift? You know, because you are a master. Uh, you're, Tom has classes online too, so if you want to learn, Tom has classes. You give you credits. So who knows if you put chemical on it? Yes, sir. Take the blue dye out. Why would a carpet pre-spray? Let me get it. Why would a carpet pre-spray? If you finish cleaning the carpet, why would it be like a, an orange or a purple? Yes. What do you? What? The high pH. Yes. It's called pH. Here's Nutri Hero for you, sir. Yeah, oh, oh. Okay. That's like at the baseball game. He stole it from him. Here, take it. Here's one for the other. Okay. You got two. That's fine. I wish you could see that on camera. The guy just stole out of the air. Could be color loss. Could be color loss. Dye side indicators. indicators. It could be all the things, right? But nine times out of ten, you use a, a pH 13 on the carpet, and then you rinse it with the soap. You don't rinse it properly, and the carpet is glowing. At pH 12, it's like radioactive. Like vroom, vroom. And then it dries orange. It dries a funny color. You stand one way, it looks one color, and the other way, that is a color shift. It's an optical illusion caused by too high of a pH or too low of a pH. If you use like a tile acid on a carpet instead of a cleaning acid, you're going you're to cause problems, but you have a radical color shift because the tile acid is not meant to be used on soft fabrics. So that is a definite callback. That's why I don't leave until the carpet's dry. Because I know I use good chemistry, right? Is there anybody out there, do you have any customers that you are the first carpet cleaner they've ever used? Hey, you're my first. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, usually if you're there, it's because the other guy sucked, right? They didn't call him back, he went out of business, right? So you don't know what the other guy used before you. What if the other guy used Tide? Tide pods, put them in his scrubber, scrub the carpet with Tide, and then extract it with plain water. What do you think is gonna happen now that you go there and it's a soiled carpet, but now you hit it with pH 13. It rinse it with a pH 10. What, have you fixed the problem? You've added to the problem. I get lots and lots of phone calls from people that have blotching issues, well, I used the right chemistry, Rob, what's wrong? I said, you may be using the right chemistry, but what about the guy before you? Or well, the homeowner. You have to assume that the person before you was a worse cleaner than you and used the absolute worst products the worst possible way. You have to assume that. That's why they're not back. They find yes. Someone else. They find someone else. 90% so, of the customers that are dissatisfied don't call and complain. They just don't call you back. They don't move on to the next. They will. They will. So what happens now is that when you guys are using acid rinse and a pH 9.5, you're less likely to cause issues with the monster hiding in the pad. The Tide Pod, the Simple Green, the blue detergent from the dollar store. It was an awesome chemical. You guys have that? This is like a California thing. They have awesome, awesome chemical at the dollar orange store. Orange. Yeah, orange, orange power, orange chemical. The awesome is orange in color here. Oh, it's okay, okay, because it's blue in some cases too. The powder is blue. And what happens is that, does anybody know what the difference is between laundry detergent and carpet cleaning detergent, right? Because I clean my, I don't clean my clothes with carpet cleaning detergent. Why not? It's like, it's good stuff, right? Why don't you use Tide at home? Does anybody know what the term water miscible means? Come on, I got, more, I got more gifts here, come on. Water miscible, have you ever heard that term? It mixes with 
Mix it well with water? Yes, and it's, it's easily rinsable because it mixes well with water. The purpose of carpet cleaning is to use as little water as possible to get the job done, right? Here we go, here's some sizzle. That's why we have more phosphates too than laundry. Yes, so we want to use as little water as possible, right? I use a glide and I clean it 400 PSI. And I have a CDS and I, I average temperatures of 220. It's boiling, and I have an acid coming out of my wand. And if at 9.5 it doesn't fix it, I switch to the detergent and I'm good. But here's the thing, is that I'm usually in my waste tank for average house, I'm only dumping about 20 gallons of water after a long day. Because a lot of it I'm evaporating with the glide. You don't want to use as much water, you don't want to have 50 gallons of water pass over the carpet. Part of balanced chemistry mean, it means you don't have to use a ton of water. So when my wife washes my clothes and tied, there's like three rinse cycles. My washing machine uses like 100 gallons of water every time I wash something, right? The washing machines flood, flood the fabric, right? We don't flood the carpet. We just want to clean the fiber on the top. Are they, cleaning you to, are you, are they paying you to clean the pad? No, so don't clean the pad. That's why I'm not against water claws. I have a lot of opinions. Water claws are okay, but if I can get away with doing low moisture cleaning and getting the fiber wet and not getting the pad so wet and leave, leave the crap in the pad, I'm okay with that. I'm a cleaner, not a restoration guy. They want to pay me to pull up the carpet and the pad, replace the pad. That's, I work for Coit, they do that. You do that too, so Tom does that as well. But here's the point is that don't make problems for yourself saying, well, I need to do a good job and I need to soak the pad too. Some cleaners do that. It's like, oh, I need to do 800 PSI because I want to do a full clean. No, clean with as little pressure as possible. I'll tell you what, if you guys are using truck mounts, if you're using as little pressure as possible, your heat will go up. If you're cleaning at 500 to 800 PSI, your heat drops off. I don't care what truck mount you have, heat drops off. You pull that trigger and you're cleaning, heat goes down. You clean less than 500 PSI, you will maintain 200, 220 all the way. And 220 acetic acid, you are neutralizing all the crap. And if you have a glide, make some dry passes, the carpet is drying an hour without a fan. I do that. That's how I, that's how I work. I don't like putting on fans because it leaves like a funny imprint on the floor. Then I go, I got to walk back across the carpet to go get the fan. So if I can't avoid that, I do. But I like gliding. I'm there. I just do a couple extra dry strokes with the glide, and I'm winding with a drier carpet. But because I'm using 220 degrees of heat, it evaporates quicker. I also ask for ventilation. It's okay. Like here in Vegas, it's hot. I say, don't turn on your AC, but can I turn on the fan and circulate the air until the homeowner, the carpet will dry faster. Also, it'll ventilate the steam and the chemicals. They're like, yes. So it's okay to ask the homeowner to turn on the fan. The fan's not gonna cost them any money. It's the AC or the heat that'll do it. So you wanna vacate the air as quickly as possible. So I use boiling hot water pH 9.5 pre-spray chemistry, an acid rinse, a glide, hot water, low moisture, I'm not getting callbacks. So that's the key to success. And if you have employees, don't give them the hot stuff. Put the mild stuff on the truck, and, or put the hot stuff in the corner and say, don't use it, break glass if necessary. Don't, don't, be, don't go to that right away. Too many guys are using a shotgun to go hunting for quail. You don't want to use a shotgun on the carpet and blast it. Be a better cleaner, use more finesse. So, uh, is that my time? Is this, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've been talking and I have a bad sense of time. What are we at? Okay, we're at, oh, I got, I got five more minutes and doing a 3.30, I got five more minutes, great. So I'm gonna spend a minute talking to you guys about stains. Okay, because balanced chemistry is not just carpet cleaning. You have the stains, 
How many people here use oxidizers to, to unstain the carpet? Use this uh, oxidizing spray, right? Okay. What is the pH of the oxidizer that you're using? 3.2. Yes, it's very. It's a peroxide. It, it'll burn your fingers. Okay. What else does it burn? It can burn the carpet or it can burn the fabric. Okay. If you are cleaning a nylon carpet and you know it's nylon. The IICRC demands a carpet inspection before you clean. They do. If you take Tom's class or Doug Heiferman's class, you gotta disattach the carpet from the wall, inspect the backing, cut off a fiber. Yeah, it's part of the 12-step program. You don't have to disattach, why don't you just move a heating vent yeah. and look at the back? I know, I know. You're but but if, if the IICRC manual talks about doing a fiber, inspect the backing, whatever. I don't do that because I have, I've been doing it since I was 15, now I'm 55. So I can spot a nylon carpet a mile away. Maybe you can too as owner operators, right? But you have an employee working for you or you're new to the business and you have a polyester that is more susceptible because it's a softer fiber more susceptible, or you have something that's oh, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a natural blend, maybe a polyester blend with maybe a silk or poly, or like a rayon carpet. If you blast it with a high pH, what can you do to that more softer, more susceptible, more vulnerable fiber with that strong oxygen? Brown it, bleed. Brown it bleed it, brittleize it. Cuticle, all sorts of problems, right? So why would anybody have a, a, a pH 3 peroxide spray in their van? It's a medicine and it's useful to when you need it, right? But if you have employees or if you're working for yourself, that's not your first go-to item. If you read any spotting guide from any popular product, what is the first thing you lead with with balanced chemistry to test out a spot? You have a spot on the carpet, you're not going to taste it. Solvent. Why do you use a solvent to test out the spot? Not, someone other than you, because I want them to learn too. If you have a solvent, right? Why do you use a solvent on the carpet to start? You're technically right in some ways. There is no pH. The so pH is Na. You, in order to have pH, you have to have percentage of hydrogen. So as long as you don't pour the solvent and it, and it destroys the backing, right? It's non-reactive. You know why solvent's non-reactive is that if you have a twist, okay, if you get it wet, it untwists, then it dries, and it just puts back all the way. That's fiber distortion. Solvents will not do fiber distortion. Solvents will not affect the fiber. If you have a wrinkly curtain, you spray solvent on it and then, then vacuum it, the curtain, its curtain's still wrinkly because the, the solvent has no effect on the wrinkles. But it eats grease and oil. So if you have it's a, it's a, it's a grease or oil spot or a makeup spot on the carpet, it'll come up with the solvent. If the solvent does not work, then what does it have to be? What's left? What does that have to be for, for a thing of NutriClean? If it's not a solvent-based stain, what is the only other, on planet Earth, there's only one other choice. If it's not solvent, it's a, what was that? Water, agua, okay? Yes, it's water, it's a water-based stain, which means, it, and what, what are water-based stains? You got pee-pee, you got poo-poo, food, vomit, blood. food, blood, anything from the human body, okay? So we're just big bags of water that leak, or dogs even more so. So the point is though, is now you have to go through you use the hottest spotter, the pH 3 peroxide, is that your next step? What is the next product you use? Use a neutral product. And if that doesn't work, you have an enzyme product that's more gentle, like a scat. If that doesn't work, then you go to the peroxide. Actually, then you go to alkaline and acid. Alkaline and acid, that's right. Use the alkaline spotter, then you, Acid should be your last step, the peroxide. But if you put it on your truck, 
And you think, oh, I don't need a whole spotting kit. I just need the peroxide. No. You will, you, will, you will buy a couch or a carpet eventually. And you will cause problems. And then you make a bad name for the industry. And you got you're real smart. That's why we're here. We're smart. I'm not degenerating anybody. But it may seem, because I'm a sales rep, I sell chemical, right? Don't skimp on the spotters, OK? You need to have five spotters on your truck. You don't need five pre-sprays. But five spotters, a solvent spotter, a neutral spotter, a high alkaline spotter, an acid peroxide, OK? And maybe an enzymatic one, OK? So you, have, you want to have at least five spotters? Okay, I hate those, but yeah, reducing agents. But use use reducing agent like last. Because once you use it, use a reducer before you use an oxidizer. I don't agree with that. Chemically, yeah, but nine times out of ten, the oxidizer will work without the odor. Is that my time? I'm at three thirty. What was that? I don't, I don't like going to... Organic red dye or synthetic red dye. If it's organic, you're going to use an oxidizer. oxidizer Tom Cermak's talking about the difference between organic red dyes and synthetic red dyes. Sorry. No, no, it's good, though. No, I have my audience here. I got people on here. So what happens, though, is that you have some cheap wine. They add red to it. Oh, it's a red wine stain, right? And you're treating it like an organic red stain, but it's not because it's two-buck chuck. They, they want the rosé to look more rosé, they add dye to it. Okay? Same with some coffee. That's why I like working in, in this facility, Caesar's Palace. There's no two-buck chuck anywhere in this building. I work for Coit. I come in here with my master's certification. I'm getting a red wine stain out of the carpet. I know it's the good stuff. I know it's the good stuff. So I know how to treat it. We're in somebody's house, and there's not a Mercedes in the driveway, and it gets two-buck chuck on the, on the shelf then you have to assume that you have red dye on the carpet, not just natural organic red dye. Well, that's my time for today. My name is Robert Falzone. I'll be teaching, uh, a teaching tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mr. Cmac. I'll be teaching tomorrow a different topic about add-on services that will not get you in trouble as a carpet cleaner. A lot of, there's a company here. I won't mention who they are. They'll get me in trouble. They're trying to sell roof washing equipment to carpet cleaners, OK? Don't get out of your comfort zone. Don't, don't start doing stuff that if you fall off the roof, your insurance company's like, what are you doing on the roof? You're a carpet cleaner. Okay, don't do stuff as add-on businesses that are out of your lane. So tomorrow we'll talk about easy add-on businesses that you probably already have the equipment for that you can do to get more dollars out of that house, okay? So thank you for coming. And if you want more samples, come by the DSC booth. I have a discount code at DSC, dscprod.com. My code is ROB10. So if you want to buy any of this stuff and you don't have a DSC dealer in your area, you can use my discount code and use ROB10 to get 10% off any of the products, okay? The SCAT and the NCAP Hero are awesome products. You should check them out. All right? So thank you very much for coming.